and welcome to the Prairie Fiber Witch Podcast. I'm Sarah, coming to you from Edmonton, Alberta, on the Canadian Prairies. Um, this is episode 19, which is kind of wild. Um, this is where I sort of talk about my crafty pursuits, mostly knitting. Mostly knitting, for the most part. Sometimes other things, but these days it's mostly knitting. Um... I've been furiously working on my e-portfolio, which is the culmination for my master's degree in library and information studies, and I'm having a crampy day, so I'm taking kind of doing other things today, so I thought I would take a little time to podcast, because I do have things over here to show you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been like a month, I guess. I guess we're doing monthly these days. Which is perfectly fine, I guess. Um, I'm, yeah, like, I'm just, I've achieved the sort of top knot situation. Um, which I guess means that I have to just, like, not care about trying to keep my hair tidy when I put it up. Anyway, I'm still working with that one. So just impromptu right now. Um, the sweater I'm wearing is the only hand spun sweater that I have made so far. This is the, the, my first time um, spinning for a sweater that I finished. I finished the spinning like maybe two and a half years ago. And then I knit the sweater I think two years ago. Um, yeah, and this is the Parisian Dreams Pullover by um, Knitting Expat, Mina Philip. Um, but I, I made mine cropped, which, I don't know, do you want to see? I've never shown you this sweater, so maybe I'll show you. I'll go over here a little bit. Little cropped sweater. Now, it kind of hits exactly where my bee belly kind of protrudes out, so I do kind of pull it down a lot. I think it would look a lot cuter with a dress, but, um, I don't know. When I'm just hanging out in the basement, I have really like wearing a pullover, so. Um, okay, what have I finished? I'm not going to look at them in any particular order, I don't think. Um... I don't think I've finished a lot since in the past month, but I have been working on lots of different things, um, especially from my list of whips. I haven't, well, I cast one new thing on, but I'll tell you about that. So these are a pair of mittens that I showed you on my uh, big whip um, podcast a few times ago. Uh, these are mittens that I started back in 20, I think at the beginning of 2018. And then um, I had finished one mitten without the thumb and then put it on hold for a long time. So I finally, I just was like, okay, I'm just gonna finish these. So I did the thumb on the one and then cast on the second one and just got it done. And these are an improvised design that, um, that I came up with. I had knit a similar player of mittens for my dad at a slightly different gauge and a slightly different size. So I redid the numbers for the gauge that I was getting with the yarns that I was using and um, made them for my mom. The idea behind these mittens was she had started a mitten project for herself to knit, a color work mitten project with this very light pink um, alpaca yarn and then a white and then she knit entire mitten it was her first color work project it, it didn't it ended up being a mitten that fit like no human hand um, and the contrast was very poor between the two colors so you couldn't see the pattern at all so um, she got really frustrated with with that and was like would you just knit me mittens with this so I did I started but I don't really like working with alpaca so I think that's probably why I put them down. But here, these are done. Um, 
And yeah, I did a nice little, I used this little side pattern piece that I think is on the cell, um, Scandier cell boo socks. I liked that detail. So then trying to work out the decreases so that it doesn't end up being super pointy. Yeah, so it's kind of attempt to be rounded. I don't think I'll ever write this into a pattern. Um, well, I would have to be with a different chart anyway, because I grabbed this chart off of somebody else's project, so it's not my design. Um, yeah, so that's these mittens. Mm, so, the pink, the very light pink, is Illimani Baby Llama or Baby Alpaca in a light pink color. And then the purple is a um, sock yarn, um, which is a Sisu sock yarn by Sadness Garn in a purple. I put the, I always put my details in the description box um, with any pertinent links. I'm trying to let link less to Ravelry, um, but um, some t for things that are improvised, that's the only place that has any information. So, but if you have any questions, you can always ask. And I'll be happy to share that with you. And I think what I knit these on, two and a half millimeter needles, with the idea there would be a denser fabric. And like the, I think the, the Illimani is like, I think supposed to be a DK, but it knit up to this gauge quite fine. Um, I mean, it's kind of dense, but I don't know. I think it matches pretty well with the the gauge of the fingering wake saw again. Um, yeah, so that was kind of like pick up, finish very quickly. Um, and then another thing that I worked on, which I think is also a new cast on since last time, I bought this sock set from Mackenzie of M to the Third, and um, it included this main color, and then uh, two mini skeins, one this purple for the toe, and then this pink that I used for the heel. And I often can use like, if I'm doing contrasting heels, toes, and cuffs, I can use less than 50 grams for a pair for myself. So I made the, you can see that there's like two pairs here. Um, and so I wanted to challenge myself to see how many socks I could get out of one set of yarn. And so I thought if I do all the toes in one color and all the heels in one color and all the cuffs in a third color, then I should be able to get two pairs of socks, um, which is true. And I actually have a little bit, I think I have about 10 grams. I think I only use like half of each mini of each of the minis for all the te all the toes, heels, and cuffs. And I think I have like 20 grams left of the main thing. So I think I could get a fifth sock out of that if I really wanted to. But I'm fine with four. Uh, I mean, having two pairs of socks <coughs> is good enough. And um, I've already worn these. I had to grab them out of the hamper, so they're not in the most pristine condition. Um, I've gotten a little bit out of the habits of podcasting, but there you go. These are two... <coughs> oh, I think I need some more tea. <coughs> that oatmeal cookie is rough on the throat. Ugh. Oh. So that's two pairs of socks, um, and I knit these on two millimeter needles. I was working on uh, DPNs, and this was my, you know, good old stockinette socks are great for reading and knitting, Re you know, doing readings for school. And then um, the only thing that I've cast on in the past while, and I just, I think I, I knit these in about a week, these are a pair of sample socks for M to the third. So she sent me the yarn and the pattern and I knit these socks and I'll send them back to her this week. So I thought I might as well podcast while I can show them to you. <coughs> Again with the oatmeal. 
Okay, so this was um, this was using her Mezcla yarn, which you can see the blue. Uh, where's the area where you can see the blue? Here on the heel. Oh yeah, that look shows up very nicely. You can see this is a lovely marled yarn that she, um, I think she has it spun for her and then she naturally dyes over top of it. So this one was dyed with indigo and she's paired it. Uh, she picked out a non-superwash merino that she has, which is a very squishy base um, to go with it. So I imagine she's probably gonna make kits for this or something. Um, she's, these are gonna be part of um, I, yeah, she's, she's going to be part of a yarn fest coming up at the beginning of May. So she, that's what these samples are for. And these were very fun to knit. I mean, I did I knit them in a week, uh, mostly because like, because there's all these little, little motifs, it's easy to just work through the chart. And then like, this is, that's the last motif in the chart. So once you've worked one once through the chart, you've done most of the sock. So it's like two and a half chart repeats or something is the whole sock. And it is done with a, an afterthought heel. So you, um, it's done where you place waist yarn um, in the motif so that you can go back and knit the um, heel without interrupting the color work pattern, which is, yeah, a good way to work a color work sock. These I knit on, um, I started them on Magic Loop, but I find my tension with color work is it gets a little weird at the edges of the Magic Loop. So I ended up switching to DPNs. For the cuffs, heels, toes, um, I worked on a two millimeter needle. And then for the color work, I actually worked on a two and a half millimeter needle so that it would have a nice, nicer tension and fit nicely onto, so onto a sock blocker. So um, I think that should work nicely. And um, this is gorgeous. Um, although my dad was like, how do you know that they're gonna be a pair if they look so different one from the other? And I was like, well, first of all, they're not for me. And second of all, this is probably good for samples because then you can see what the yarns look like in both versions, right? Yeah. So I'll be sending these off to her in the mail this week. Um, and that's all that I've finished, those uh, three projects. Which, I mean, like knitting two pairs of socks, it's like knitting two pairs of socks. So three pairs of socks and a pair of mittens is not bad. Okay, what have I been working on? besides finishing some socks. Um, this, I can't remember if I showed you this or not. Um, I was probably smaller when I did show you, although I haven't worked on it in a little while, in a few weeks. This is the hat that I cast on as my birthday cast on back in February. Um, and this is the the Musselberg hat by Isolde Teague, knit out of some uh, of some yarn that I had uh, kicking around from Woolly Mammoth Fiber Company. This is her natural sock base, and I think the colorway is called Hatch. Oh, and this is probably where my other, yep, yeah, this is where my other two millimeter needles are. Um, <laughs> I was looking for, I was like, where are those two millimeter needles? And here they are. So, um, yeah, maybe I should like work on finishing this. I mean, I still have a lot left in the ball to get through. So it'll be a little while before I get to the decreases. And this is an interesting hat construction where you, you start by increasing and then you knit the body of the hat and then you decrease and then you flip one side into the other and then you end up with a doubled hat which i think would be quite suitable for an alberta winter or canadian winter in general uh probably like i imagine till like minus 20 i can't imagine well i don't know how well this would do in the deep cold but tbd and yeah i mean this will be i do have an i 
I have been sort of working through a number of stockinette projects for reading and knitting, so I'll probably get to this at some point too, maybe after the the socks that I'm working on. So this will get finished at some point. Now that we're kind of getting into spring and not needing hats anymore, but um, I knit. I really want to take a bite of this cookie, but it's like I I don't want to start choking on on the oatmeal dust. Um. Yeah, but my I my knitting whims. I'll knit a sweater in the summer. I don't care. I just knit what I want to knit when I want to knit it, and it doesn't get so hot here that I can't knit with a sweater on my lap. Um. Yeah. The next thing that I'm working on is actually a pair of like Christmas socks that I started earlier this year. This is um, some yarn that I got from. Um, Tiny Human Knits. I really love her self-striping sock yarns and she has some great Christmas colorways. This was one of the colorways that I bought at Christmas time and I felt like knitting it up so I started a pair of socks and like I'm trying different ways of basically because her her yarns come in a 50 gram skein um, I like the idea of using sort of sock tube construction. I do not have a uh, circular sock machine. So I'm working, I'm sort of trying to figure out my favorite way to knit a tube um, for making into socks. So this time I'm trying to start with a toe and then finish with a toe and see how I like that. And so I'll end up with contrasting heels and cuffs. Um, I had started with this blue, but I found this very like American flag looking so I'm going to switch out I think I'm going to switch out I'm going to do this toe in green and then I'm going to take out this blue and re-knit the green with the green here and just keep it very Christmassy looking um yeah I think that suits me better than American flag um and yeah I'm knitting this one magic loop on some two millimeter needles US size zero and these mini skeins are from an advent calendar that I got last year from Wild in the Woods. And I think it's a non-superwash base. I don't know. There wasn't a lot of information on the... There wasn't any information on what the yarns were that, uh, that we got in the advent calendar. Um, or colorway names or anything. So it's just one of these advent minis that came in a green. Um, this blue was also from that collection of advent minis. Yeah, so that's, I mean, I've been working on this toe today, so I think I'll be able to finish these socks this week, but I thought it would be interesting to show it in this, like, tube scarf. I mean, it is almost, you could make it into a little cowl, <clears throat> a little tube cowl, if instead of, if you knit the tube and then just grafted it onto itself, that could be a neat little cowl, I guess, or like, Gord Downey had this at their farewell concert. He was wearing this like two socks um, s stitched together kind of made into a little scarf thing. That would de that's definitely the proportions of this. So um, Gord Downey is was the um, lead singer for the Canadian band The Tragically Hip, who um, were very important when I was in high school important to Canadians. I don't think anybody else cares about the tragically hip. Um, and something else that I've been working on that I sort of, a couple, like, so, uh, basically I got one nice comment from, um, from someone about my advent mini blanket that I had started saying that they would be interested in knowing in like a recipe or something and so I decided maybe I should write a pattern for this. I know originally I was saying I wasn't sure about writing up a pattern because it is similar to a pattern that had just come out um but I mean this is a traditional quilt block so I don't think anybody owns the design to this pattern uh, this 
kind of design. And it's a different weight of yarn and it's a different kind of construction. So I've been working on um, developing, figuring out how to write it up and like how it should be constructed so that you get instructions on like how to make a whole blanket if you want. Um, and um, like, as you can see, I've, it's sort of, it's a very sort of traditional quilt in that it has this like, what do they call the sashing around it with these little corner posts added in. Um, and like, so this is, so the idea is that it would be sort of a modular construction. So you build a block like this, and then you can figure out your layout, how big you want to make it. And then you know where you need to add. So like, just on, you know, when you're doing multiple blocks like this, then you've got your sashing in place. So you can just do one seam and then you can pick up and knit the sashing on the other sides and then the corner posts along the one side and the bottom to finish up the blanket, um, seam it all together and there you go. So that's kind of what I'm, where I'm at at the moment on this. Um, I've written up um, a pattern, an instructions for that and I'm having um, some friends take a look at it um, to s make sure that everything makes sense for the construction. And like the idea, there is seaming involved, but I've tried to reduce it. So you, for this block, you only do three seams. So you have to seam here and then down the sides. Um, and then for, you'll also have to seam when putting the blocks together. So, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so I, I think it'll be fun. And it's like, it's sort of portable because you can just work on one block at a time, which takes me about like an evening and a half, I would say for a block, maybe let's say like two, three evenings for, to make a block. So it's not a huge amount of work that goes into each one. They're fun to make because you're doing different things, um, any, uh, to make it. You're not always knitting the same thing over and over again. Um, so yeah, they're like fun little units to make. So I have made up and I've been having fun making them. Um, I mean, I had fun coming up with it in the first place and then making them. So I've got, how many do I have done? Two, four, six, eight, nine blocks so far. Um, and like the pattern will have instruction with, will have some ideas about what kind of size you might want to make yours, some suggestions for that, along with ideas of how much yarn you're going to need. And like, I've been using, um, this is primarily a sport weight project, but it's like fingering and sport weight works into here. This is another project that's been using my advent minis. That's kind of what I thought it up for was to use the advent minis. This was the mini here. Um, so it doesn't need a large quantity of yarn necessarily for each one, especially if you want something that's like kind of scrappy. So, um, yeah, so that's coming along and I don't know. I don't know if anybody will want to knit this blanket, but there's going to be instructions, I guess. So there we go. I'm, yeah, and I decided to go whole hog into these naturally dyed mini skeins that I had collected from um, Kalia the Luddite. She's a local to me dyer who works with yarn spun in the province um, that's been grown by, um, by uh, sheep farms, local to me sheep farms, and then spun in Alberta and then she dies on top of it. So th some of these are on like, um, and then some of the creams and stuff, like, like this is Briggs and Little Sport. Um, this brown I think is Tugu Wool. Um, this green is some Rauma Phenol. And yeah, there's also the custom woolen mills in here because they make a base that's similar to the Briggs and Little Sport. So it doesn't have to be an expensive blanket. I'm primarily working with non-superwash. I think everything's non-superwash in here. So 
but like a superwash I'm sure it would work too um yeah one of the people working on the design is or working on testing the pattern is I started one out of like the really some of the really bright colors that Briggs and Little makes um and then doing it using a dark black background so that should be interesting too if they get um further along on that project so yeah so that's coming along so I've been yeah I'll get back to this but yeah like I think I had four blocks before so I've knit another five so and I think I'm gonna make like a lap size blanket for this um yeah so close to halfway um, and then the last thing that I've been knitting on that my, my poor dad's sweater that he has been patient that I started at Christmas time that he's very patiently waiting for and he's not putting any pressure on me to work on this but I feel I feel bad for just like always picking it up and then putting it down and then picking it up and then putting it down and I made a whole bunch of mistakes so I actually had knit an entire sleeve that didn't fit anybody. It was, it had too few stitches because I missed an entire section of increases on this pattern. Nothing to do with the pattern, everything to do with my attention span. Um, so I had to rip back to like, just after the, the, like the, these increases here and then do a whole bunch more increases and yeah. But it's a very cool, this is the Tsubaki pullover. I can't remember the designer, but I'll put it on the screen. Um, and it's a very lovely, intense cable pattern. Like these cables are crazy, right? This like eight over eight cable. It's so chunky that it like folds halfway. Very interesting. Um, those ones I can't cable without a cable needle. I have to you have use a cable needle for those. Um, yeah, and then so I have one sleeve done that he has tested. He has tried on, um, and it is the right length. I ended up having to lengthen it, lengthening it, lengthening it a little bit for him. Um, and so I'm working on. The other sleeve and this construction is really interesting because I mean you stop the body and you work on the sleeves and you work on them flat and then um, and then you cast off without like pulling your yarn through at the end so you leave it with one live stitch and then you do this what they call a zip up seam which is very fun to do I'm not gonna give it away but it looks very cool and very tidy. Um, and then that becomes, so then it's like, there's a seam, but it doesn't have any bulk on the inside. Let me turn this inside out. So it has the nice, no bulk of a seamless sweater. Like it kind of looks like a seam, but that's not very raised or anything, but it still seems like it gives it the structure of a seamed garment, so. That's very interesting. Um, the yarn that I'm using for this, do I have, yep. Yeah, I have a ball here, is the Durham Natura Ulis, um, which is a very nice yarn. Um, I think I've tried to translate this live before. It's 100% wool, it's a non-superwash yarn. The color is Iroise, which is this lovely teal that my dad really, really loves. He's really excited about this. Um, and yeah, this is what I'll be working on next after I finish these socks, the, the tube socks. So I will get back to it, I promise. I'm excited to like get a sweater finished. And then I have one last thing that I'm working on that has slipped off my little table here. Can I grab it? Yeah, I'm gonna just knock everything off. Give me a second. Okay. And then, the last thing that I have picked up out of my whip box 
is, um, you've seen this a long time ago, if you've been around that long. This is what I call my Earthsea cardigan. It is a third version of Isolde Teague's Stockbridge cardigan. It doesn't look very far along, but it was even less further along when you last saw it. I think it was just past the ribbing. And um, I call it my Earthsea cardigan because this colorway has a tendency to look like it kind of looks gray, it kind of looks blue, it kind of looks greenish, it has purple flecks in it, so like depending on the light, it can look really different. And I discovered this color of Jameson and Smith um, when I was first reading um, the Earthsea trilogy. No, the first four books of the Earthsea um, books by Ursula K. Le Guin. And so it really seemed like a wizard's color to me. So, and this is um, colorway 1280 of Jameson and Smith. Um, they call it two-ply jumper weight? Yes. Um, Spindrift is Jameson's of Shetland. Um, yeah, so I do have a cone of this, but this one I am working from the original balls, 25 gram balls that I had purchased when I first discovered this color, or this, yeah, this yarn, this color, and I'm just, I just love this. So it has been getting some work on it, um, yeah, during Zoom calls and, um, during doing readings for school. Yeah, so that's coming along slowly but surely as these cardinals end up being. And that's all that I've been knitting in the past little while. Let us talk about books. I have been reading books. Since last time, I've been reading like lots of nonfiction in the past month. Um, I started by picking, getting another, uh, getting a book from the library that I had previously checked out. And so I got to finish it called Threads of Life, A History of the World Through the Eye of a Needle by Claire Hunter. And um, like the first chapter talks about the Bayou tra Tapestry, which everybody considers a tapestry, but it was actually embroidered. And then it goes on to talk about all these other like moments in textile history um, that have been important. Like one of my favorite chapters is when she talks about like political needlecraft um, and talking about um, suffragette banners from Britain. And apparently like the suffragette banners that they created for protest purposes were like heavily embroidered with all these wonderful motifs represent like you know very sort of metaphorical and representative of like different um uh, probably bible stories and like different sort of themes from literature that were all richly embroidered in all these wonderful wild colors on these huge banners that just was like going through London and I think they got used in several protests. The first one not very well attended, the next one with that like 20,000 people went to and then the next one was like 40,000 people or 400,000. I don't remember the exact number. But it just it just really her description of it just really evoked like this wonderful riot of color through the streets and it sort of built on this tradition of these heavily worked union banners that people were used to seeing, but like taking it even further than that. And unfortunately, like none of these banners survived because the people who were in charge of the museums didn't think that they were important to keep. Let's just think about that for a second. Because patriarchy, right? So like this wonderful moment of women's history that's just like totally erased um and 
yeah, another chapter also talks about a Mary Queen of Scots who it's not clear whether she embroidered everything because it was also common to have somebody embroider stuff for you um, while she was imprisoned, but none of her work survives. So like there's this very interesting thing that happens that there's like women are involved in creating these artworks that then in like the struggle of power and their position um, in the world means that um, that history decides to destroy what they've created. So like there's only descriptions left of these things. And that seems to be a common theme for a lot of these um, kinds of needlework projects. Or like another project was, oh, it's been a while since I read this book, so I'm not gonna remember all the details. But like in a, I think in a regime in a South American country, I don't wanna get the, I don't remember which one specifically, but where these mothers were embroidering, um, handkerchiefs I think no I'm I'm mixing a whole bunch up because there's one where women were in prison and so they were embroidering han their signatures on handkerchiefs as like that would get smuggled out as proof that they were even being held there and I can't remember what country that was in but I think that happened a few times um in these projects that she described and then like there's also mention of the AIDS quilt project that happened I believe in the late 80s that got presented in in Washington DC or another one that was like memorial quilts that was the chapter on like memorial embroideries and memorial quilts was there was this um this historic quilt that this woman made that's like that's embroidered it has embroidered and applique motifs and it's like a big graveyard and so the coffins are on the edge of the quilt and then as um, the people in her family die she would move the coffins with their names to the middle of the quilt and like there were all these motifs of flowers and things inside and the idea was that it was gonna it was to be passed down in her family and then it would be like her descendants would you know, add names and add people and move people into the graveyard as, as was timely. And it's just like a lot of the time I just spent Googling images of some of these projects because there, unfortunately there's not pictures in the book, which I would have really have liked to see because they're just like, they're such visual pieces and she does a really good job of describing, um, describing what they look like um but I I I like pictures I'm a visual person so I like to see things yeah it was very interesting and like I got to see a whole bunch of projects that I didn't know existed so that was a very interesting read and then continuing on with that um another book that I had picked up I had taken out from the library because I thought it looked interesting. Um, I think I saw it on, on the online catalog um, and then didn't have time to read it. So I checked it out again so that I could actually read it and it was fascinating. It's called Fashion Victims, The Dangers of Dress, Past, Pre Past and Present by Allison, Ma Allison Matthews David. And like, so there's a chapter on like arsenic green dyes and like the flammability of um, cotton, do they call it Georgette? Cotton netting that was like, that was originally made for, for ballerina costumes and, um, and like the flammability of that. The, yeah, because lighting in the ballet was just candles at that point and, um, yeah, like that chapter was fascinating because there's this one ballerina who basically um, they had at that point, they understood the flammability of their costumes and they had made like a safe version of these skirts, but it was really stiff and hard to work in and kind of ugly. So she 
actually refused to wear the safe skirt and so she wore the dangerous skirt and ended up in a horrible fire so to the and it was such a disaster that they ended up changing the way that the lights like they were still lit with fire but they made like an inverted thing with a reflector so that that wasn't exposed candles that were so dangerous so i mean it just goes to show that like a lot of the safety features that we think of in clothing or like children's clothing and choking hazards and all that it has come about because of tragedy not because of like forethought um which is wild to think about but um i mean i think that's sort of par for the course for um human history and like there another the chapter about like not only the arsenic dyes, but then the dyes that come after that, the that were like derived from coal, that people were, that there was, because these, these dyes created these wonderful bright colors, but because they caused, they caused like uh, skin reactions, right? Basically, um, just from having them against your skin and like sweating into them because they were colorful socks, that that, caused an entire like change in fashion from going away from those bright colors and like renewing interest in natural dyeing which is kind of i mean we still there's that's not the same reason why there's a return back to natural dyeing now but uh, you, you can see the origins of that kind of interest in that aesthetic um yeah a very again another interesting read I'm, I'm having some cookie. I'm going to live dangerously. Um, and she goes a little bit into how some of these dangers are still, like, present to a certain extent. And then next in my parade through things that I kind of started but then had to return and then... Um, got out a second time is um the book braiding sweet grass by robin wall kimmerer i think a lot of people have sort of looked at this book um the subtitle is indigenous wisdom scientific knowledge and the teachings of plants and the author is a botanist an in uh, an indigenous botanist and so she talks about how when she was going into university to study botany, like that there was this, her motiva her motivations to study more about plants uh, were in conflict with the like scientific understanding of plants or like the sci the, the point of view of scientists, right? Like the, to, look, to look at these things in a cold way, an academic way without appreciation, without appreciation for their beauty, right? And so her, it's not really an argument, but like her, she's trying to introduce this other perspective of ways to look at things. And that like, one of the things that um, is a key theme in the book was, I'm not, I'm not great, I was never great in English, so I don't know if it's theme or whatever. Um, but one of the thing, points that she tries to make in the book is that like, it is possible for humans to live and be to live in concert with nature and to be working with nature in a beneficial way without just over harvesting and you know like if we do these things in balance that it's possible to actually benefit both parties that it doesn't have to be a one-way kind of relationship so some definitely an interesting perspective change and also like beautifully written wonderful to read um very poetic very poetic yeah so i really enjoyed that one and um she makes some very and she like the pace of the book is like it kind of gradually introduces you to some of the like horrible things that that you know 
white white people have done to nature. Um, she's centered, I think, mostly in the eastern United States. So in the later chapters, she gets into like um, this one lake area that has been horribly polluted. Um, oh, excuse me. And how the land is starting to sort of how land and nature is trying to sort of recover things um and like and ideas about how that how we could work with nature to make to to make that work continue um yeah and i don't know that she necessarily like poses concrete answers as to like how things should be but um she raises some interesting questions about how um how we live with nature and how we go about um like farming practices she doesn't get into the detail like into the details of that but say like forest management instead of just creating a forest to cut it down like that there could be a different idea the the sort of the idea of creating a forest to regenerate a forest and not just to have more things to cut down um yeah so that one was a very I really enjoyed that as a plant person too because I mean you can see I have plants and these plants go all the length of my room um but and like we've we're big gardeners but it's very different kind of gardening and um yeah, I think one of the more interesting chapters was talking about, she was talking about one of her graduate students who was doing a study on, um, on, on the cultivation of sweetgrass and how, like, the patches of sweetgrass that have been, like, restored in nature and then left alone don't thrive, but the ones where there are traditional harvesting practices, they actually are, like, living, thriving areas and that like tr uh, traditional harvesting practices actually make the plants thrive in a way that they don't if they're just left on their own so that's kind of that's in that like again going back to like the relationship between the people the relationship between people and nature right and that it can be in such a way that's beneficial to both so because there's this idea that um, nature needs to be left on its own and people just need to leave the, leave nature alone and um, everything will be wonderfully restored. But that's maybe not the case. Um, and then the book that I just started last night is called Older Sister, not necessarily related, by Jenny... Hey, Jen Wills, um, who is Canadian. Um, she is, she was adopted, um, from, from a agency in Korea and then brought to Canada and raised, I believe, in Ontario somewhere. And this book, oh, I have the book here. Why don't I show you the book? it is um and in this book this book is a memoir of her um going back to meet her birth mother and her family and it's done in i don't think it's an accident that she had that there's this patchwork on the front cover this is a style of patchwork that I was um, introduced to by um, Aruna of Buku on Instagram, and it's a it's a traditional Korean patchwork piece that makes like a big like wrapping um, thing. It's a big piece of fabric that you can wrap stuff up in, like reusable gift wrap and it's made out of scraps and then the seams are all flat felled so that you can it's sort of reversible so i think 
This is not by accident that this is on here, um, although I'm not very far into it. Um, they're not really chapters and it's not, it's sort of like little snippets of, I mean, the story is being told through little pieces um, that are like a page, a page and a half, two pages of sort of different parts of the process of, um, of meeting her birth family and um, developing a relationship with them. So yeah, it has, again, it has sort of a poetic feel to it because you have sort of these little snippets. Um, yeah. And um, I think it goes into like the whole idea of um, white people going to other cultures um, to to adopt with this, I, I think again, with this idea of like white saviorism. Again, I'm not too far into the book, so, uh, but I, I think that's sort of in the background that this became like big business to basically sell babies. Um, and it probably is for a lot of, a lot of different countries in the world. Um, yeah. So. So yeah, other than that, um, I've been working on my e-portfolio, which is like 14 different essays that's due in like, I think it's due in three weeks. So I'm trying to work on like, I'm trying to get four or five done a week. So I'm just coming along. Um, and what else are we, yeah, we've been planting stuff. Today we were planting, uh, we've done all the tomatoes. My mom grows and sells tomatoes to her friends, um, like tomato seedlings. And, um, we, she's started, uh, she has started growing lots of her bedding plants from seed instead of, um, buying them at a greenhouse. Okay, that cookie's gonna get me coughing again. So we, we did, we, we a couple weeks ago, we did our first sets of planting. And then um, today we just did some more for some of the things that haven't germinated. For some reason we were, do, my mom set up this thing to like use heat mats and put it in front of a heat vent in a sunny window. So I think we ended up cooking some of the seeds instead of germinating them. So yeah, there's like, there's a temperature range and don't go above that range because then it's not gonna work. So we did some reseeding of stuff then, or today. Um, yeah. Anything interesting that we've been watching? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not really. Yeah, that's about it for me. I, again, still feeling the, like, panna cotta blahs. Oh, um, and I've had to isolate, um, so I haven't left the house in a couple of weeks. Because, um, my parents got sick. With COVID, um, they were both fine. It just manifested as, like, a bad chest cold. Um, it's, my mom's taken a little bit longer to get over it than my dad, um, but I'm, I'm going for the cookie. I'm doing it. Um, yeah, it took my mom longer to get over it than my dad did, but, um, yeah, we've just been staying home not leaving the house, can't go for a walk. And it's like, it's kind of sunny today, but it's minus five out. So I don't really want to go for a walk. Um, yeah, we got snow yesterday because Alberta. Um, yeah, and I had to like knock ice out of the rain barrel because Alberta. 
And, um, yeah. Although, apparently, they're planning to have everybody, like, vaccinated by June, which would be cool. Like, the idea that I could, like, go somewhere this summer, I could, like, see people, um, that would be crazy. To see a human in person and, like, go and do stuff in, maybe in another country, that'd be weird. That would be so nice, actually. Okay, I'm gonna finish this cookie. I'm gonna wish you a good month. Or several weeks, I don't know. My e-portfolio is due in three weeks, so you might see me at the end of April. Um, yeah. It's wild to think that, like, I'm done my master's, and, like, my dad kind of had this thought that I should just keep going and, and do a doctorate and become like a doctor which would be crazy which I'm kind of toying with the idea of that I don't know that could also be a good thing to like during you know because who's even hiring right now but I don't know we'll see at the moment I'm at, like it's hard to think about writing a you know a huge doctoral thesis when I'm in the middle of writing a semi-huge um, e-portfolio thing, I kind of calculated, and I think it'll be kind of like 30,000 words by the time I'm done with it. Which I think that's what a thesis would have been anyway, so I don't think either would have, like, it wouldn't have changed anything. Um, yeah. So toying with the idea of becoming Dr. Ayers. <clears throat> which would be kind of bonkers because I think I'd be the first person in my family to do that. To actually finish. My mom did start her doctorate, but she never got her thesis finished. Um, yeah. So on that note, um, I wish you a good month. And hopefully uh, you can get vaccinated um, where you are and be able to like go lick somebody on the side of their face. <laughs> <laughs> and not worry about it um you know if you want to you don't have to do that or like lick the wall of the metro I mean there's other diseases that you could catch that way not just the one we're all worried about all right uh on that note um yeah have a good time <laughs>